Matthew's mode of telling his story is through the use of sermons. Some books and some commentators call them discourses. And of course the most famous of those discourses or sermons is the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 to 7. And it really is a, a wonderful collection of Jesus' sayings. It's unlikely that Jesus actually spoke that whole sermon in one sitting. What's far more likely is that what Matthew has done is collected different times or different sermons or even pieces of different sermons and put them together in that three chapters. The chapters, of course, begins with the Beatitudes. And I believe that the Beatitudes really set the frame for the rest of the sermon. Because the Beatitudes, therefore, are explained and what it means to actually be blessed in each of those ways in the rest of those chapters. And so that's how our Matthew wants to begin to teach, through sermons. A very Jewish way of teaching. A very Jewish way of approaching the concept of imparting knowledge. And so, again, what we see within Matthew is a very Jewish Jesus. Now, you need to understand, though, as we've done right from the beginning in Tanakh, that one of the particular attributes of the Jews is struggle. And therefore, if you read Matthew without the concept of struggle, Matthew just becomes yet another law book. It becomes yet another book of rules where we have to identify which are the new rules that Jesus has added, where he's changed how to commit adultery. He's changed about how it is that we kill somebody. He's changed the way in which we deal with violence. He's changed and changed. But in fact, if we look at it more like a Jew, we realize that what Jesus is doing is he's entering into an argument. And so when you read the Sermon on the Mount, when you read the rest of Matthew, don't read it with saying, well, how is this a new rule for Jesus to give to us? But rather say, how is Jesus engaging us in argument, engaging us in conversation? I think one of the problems that we have with thinking that the Sermon on the Mount was all just spoken in one long monologue is that what it does is it sounds too much like what we do today in our churches where a preacher gets up into the pulpit and then in a monologue style just talks for the next 20 minutes or, or longer. The problem is, is that that's not how it would have happened in the time of Jesus. In the time of Jesus, the rabbis very seldom would just speak in monologue without any response at all. In fact, the way in which Jews have learned is through a method of question and answer. And often, not question and answer, but question and question, which we see Jesus do often within the Gospels, places like, particularly in Luke's Gospel, we see that style of teaching. What we need to connect with then is that when you read the Sermon on, on the Mount, we need to stop each time and say, how would I argue with this? How would I disagree with this? How would I, I question what Jesus is saying? If we're going to truly plumb the depths of what Jesus is trying to get us to think about. Because what you need to come to terms with is that Matthew is trying to make the reader uncomfortable. Now again, the problem is, is that most of us are Gentiles. And as Gentiles, when we read Matthew's Gospel, we are not made to feel uncomfortable. Yet, a Jewish person reading Matthew would be very uncomfortable. Right from chapter 1. In chapter 1, we see the genealogy, and I've already mentioned the wonder of God's divine plan within it. Which, of course, has caused Luke to have to, or to Matthew to have to do a little bit of, of reworking in terms of the chronology. So, in some ways, we can see that, that Matthew has, has forced the genealogy of Jesus into those 14 generations. But more than that, he's done something that no respecting Jew would do. He's added women to the genealogy. And not only has he added women, but he's added all the women of ill repute. He's added the prostitutes and the adulteress and the non-Jews into that plan of God. As if to say that somehow it was God's plan to have an adulteress and to have a, a prostitute. That in fact all those things can still be part of God's plan and that the outcome of God's plan is still there even in the midst of all the dirty washing. You can imagine that for Jews that would be embarrassing. 
That for people who thought of their heritage in terms of their Judaism, who thought in terms of who they were and their process of God, they would have looked at that and thought, what's he doing? We also see that in the birth narrative. Remember that the Jews were waiting for the Messiah. The Jews were expecting the Messiah. The Jews were, were, were waiting to see who was going to release them from the bondage of the Romans. And yet who were the first people in Matthew's gospel to acknowledge Jesus as the Messiah? Not Jews, but in fact the Magi. These people, these religious people from the East, most probably from a Gentile space, they were the ones who came and acknowledged Jesus as the Messiah. Again, what Matthew is doing is he's causing the Jewish people to have to rethink. He's shaking their foundations. He's shaking the building of their faith to tell them they need to rethink what they're doing. They need to rethink where they're going. They need to rethink also their relationship to the other peoples in the world. Because it's too easy for us. And it certainly still is, even in Christianity today. It's too easy for us to think that somehow this is about us. Matthew 28 reminds us that we are to go out and make disciples of all nations. Of all nations. Not just our group, not just our ethnicity, not just our language group, but of all nations. Matthew is wanting to disciple the Jews. He's wanting them to rethink their positions. He's wanting them to, to reconnect with what Jesus is trying to say. He's wanting them to realize that Jesus isn't just wanting to change the building of their faith. He's wanting to change the very foundations of their faith. Now, of course, for us as Gentiles, we don't see the offense that Matthew is. We don't acknowledge that offense. And so what we do so often is we therefore just skim off the top. When we read Matthew's Gospel, we need to be aware of that offense. We need to be aware of the audience. Because it's that audience that helps us then to interpret. So when you're reading Matthew, you need to keep asking yourself, how is this trying to shake me? How is this trying to reform the foundations of my faith? How is this helping me to reinterpret Torah? How is this helping me to see what the interpretation of Torah needs to be for my life now? How does this make me more than just become a Jew, but actually, actually realize that I've now become fulfilled as a Jew? I've now become a Christian. I've now become the connection with God through Jesus Christ. And then what does it do? It tells us what we need to do about it. He said, as I have become a disciple, as I've become a learner, as I've become to realize that I'm more than just my ethnicity, but actually it's part of my relationship with God, so therefore I then go out and share that with others and seek to disciple them as well in that process.